What's up, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Terror Table, a horror movie podcast. I'm one of your hosts. My name is Mitch, and with me, as always, I have... Um, Boozy. And we are bringing on a very special guest, a returning guest. He's been on multiple times at this point. He's a Terror Table Hall of Famer. We are welcoming Daniel Epler from the Cobwebs podcast onto our Halloween special. What's up, Yay. Daniel? Hey, fellas. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. I just got back from the laundromat. I washed all the blood out of my clothes, so I am good to go. Hell yeah, bro. You don't do laundry at home, or is it more inconspicuous to take it somewhere? Yeah, I don't, I don't want to get that blood all over my stuff at home. You know, it's much easier to do it while I'm out. And then right. when I get home, it right, doesn't right, look right, like right. I killed anybody. You, exactly. you know, if you're going to be killing people, you got to wear like clothes you don't really care about. So you go to Walmart and get those like weird dad shirts that say like, rather be fishing. And then, you know, like you won't miss it. <laughs> yeah, I think, Daniel, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but you also like going to the laundromat because it gives you the opportunity to go to their bathroom and write your name and shit on the wall. <laughs> That, that is that absolutely correct, Mitch. You know that is a so well. That is a Terrifier 1 throwback reference for anyone who missed <laughs> it. Uh, but yes, <laughs> uh, we are talking about Terrifier 2 today. Damien Leone's Terrifier 2 that is just crushing at the box office uh, right now. Really cool to see. But we, uh, since this is our Halloween episode, we're just going to do our roundtable thing. Talk about all the shit we've been seeing and all the stuff that we've taken in over the Halloween season because I know Boozy and I we record every couple of weeks now so we have time to really load up on our watch list and I have seen a plenty so I'm excited to talk to you guys about it but before we get on to Terrifier 2 Daniel how's your Halloween season been so far it's been really fun I've really been enjoying it I've been in i to peek behind the curtain of my life and people who listen to my podcast know this but uh my wife and i are expecting our first kid in about three Woo! months baby and that, can you say that again but when you say my wife you have to say the like borat, borat. yeah <laughs> i feel like i'd be a poser because i've never seen a borat movie okay well i mean it's better that you'd have no context of it to do a bad impression yeah try and do the borat <laughs> voice daniel yeah, my this wife. is how you announce it. <laughs> yeah, is that it? okay <laughs> me and okay. my wife all right keep talking about the incredible uh that you're having a baby yeah well just that fact i feel well thank you that fact i think has made my sentimentality about halloween explode because halloween yeah. is like the thing i'm most nostalgic about from my childhood so i just feel like extra into the spirit this year um but yeah it's been fun i haven't seen like a lot of like cool retro screenings at movie theaters or such like that but uh, i've got the chance to see a lot of really good new horror movies this year i've got to check out some old stuff that's been really fun and um i've just been having a blast i've been very much in the spooky spirit for sure that's awesome and uh the world needs more daniel stephanie epler crossover collabs uh, so, <laughs> <Remixes>. so that, <laughs> uh, the baby epler is a, a collab um but yeah no that's it that's gonna be the coolest kid and have like they're gonna have the best halloween season every year because uh, just knowing you and following your social medias and your show and everything, that kid's going to be exposed to a lot of awesome stuff. Uh, so I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited to see, hear that kid's podcast someday. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, my worst nightmare is that, like, I'll have to take down all of my horror stuff in my basement because it's too scary for him. But I'm hoping if he's just exposed to it yeah. since birth, it'll just right. be normal, you know, yeah, but you... not so normal. It's boring. If mm -hmm. you, like, run in with a really scary mask and just scream, like, a lot it's like shock therapy you know you're you're gonna acclimate the baby hang on this is good i'm writing this down this is good <laughs> I, I will say parenting that, 101 that was a big fear of mine you know uh back in the day like where I, when your dad you running know, in with a mask on no no that happened all the time um no but like considering when you it comes time to start a family and bring and you know like you guys both know how my like boozy you've been in my old place where we used to record all the Parap uh, like horror paraphernalia <laughs> <laughs> horror paraphernalia <laughs> um, no uh but yeah like the posters the toys and statues and everything and then when my sister's kids would start coming over i did notice how they reacted to the walls at uncle mitchell's house um <laughs> mainly the thing i will recommend is just hide your freddy krueger statues if you have any because that's the only one that really got my my nieces and nephew they're, they're pretty creeped out by no, chucky freddy. like chucky didn't uh well i didn't i didn't have a bunch of those, I, those I guess, big yeah. pieces yeah yeah no chucky didn't do anything for them i guess hmm. either way 
uh, once again, congratulations. That's super exciting. And let's talk about the spooky season. So, Boozy, what have you been up to the spooky season? Oh, my God. I've seen so much. Oh, my God. I, oh, my God. I, I have a couple things that are brand new, but I also have two things that are kind of older from Tubi that I'm also really excited about. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, yeah. And just quickly, not going to make a big uh, thing of this because I'm going to eventually, you know, hopefully bring uh, Jesse Swetsky on to talk about this a little bit more. But this is the first episode that I'm recording post Scream Fest, uh, where I was in Los Angeles premiering our short film, The Druid's Hand at the Chinese Theater. And uh, just long story short, it was one of the best experiences of my life. It was incredible. Met so many inspiring and talented filmmakers and you know, ran into some of my heroes. Like I was at a comic shop and I ran into Adam Green, which was pretty cool. Uh, so I went and talked to him for a little bit. Super nice. Did you guy. give him a business card? Uh, I ha- I gave him a Drew. We have a little Drew's hand cards that have like a QR code. Um, nice. But it was cool. I didn't actually I didn't realize. He, so I gave it to him. It was after we had already premiered and we were in the same short form block as Dave Parker, like his friend, his friend that is always on the movie crypt. Uh, they he named a character in Frozen after him. And I still hold that Frozen is his best movie. Like, I fucking love Frozen. Um, But yeah, Dave Parker, he's become kind of a buddy. And we played, uh, he played his film uh, Creek right next to ours. And it was awesome. Like, it was, with Jesse, we were truly spoiled. Like, Jesse Tara was there. Um, Nick Humphreys, mentor, previous guest of the show. He was out there. Um, And our short film block was insane. Like, every film that played in our block was like, oh, God. Like, (laughs) how did we end up here? Uh, there's just so many amazing films being put out there but uh, lots of cool stories Uh, this can lead right into what I think we should lead off with is the opening red carpet event at Screamfest right beside us was the premiere for Halloween ends so like 20 feet away from 20 feet away from us was fucking Jamie Lee Curtis Arnold Schwarzenegger was there um, Arnold Schwarzenegger that is so cool yeah it was crazy Um, Terminator versus Michael confirmed Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> um, but no, it was that was just absolutely insane. And quick story that I'm gonna like if anyone is, out there is interested in independent filmmaking or trying to get your own stuff off the ground, especially if you're in the horror realm, there's one person in particular that you should all want to get to know and want to bump into. And the most Mitch Oliver thing happened after it was so we didn't see the Halloween ends premiere because we were obviously at Screamfest. Um but when we finished up the opening night, Jesse and I are dressed up. We look like we're in Miami Vice. We're looking better than we've ever looked. We're walking down uh, the street to Hollywood Boulevard, and I literally bump into someone, like literally bump into a man, and I go, oh, my fucking God, that's Jason Blum. <laughs> I bumped into Jason Blum, and I fumbled. I didn't say anything, didn't give him a card, didn't <laughs> mention it's like that's the one time. Like he literally got his career started because of Screamfest with paranormal activity. He discovered it there. And I froze and did nothing. <laughs> so that's the funny thing. You didn't story. tell him how much you love him? No, no, I didn't. Um and you and blow him a kiss. It would have been, yeah. But hopefully like, what I, are you wishing? What are you wishing you said? Are you wishing you're like, hey, I made a short film? Yeah, what's Will that you, yeah, just feature movie for me? No, it's not even that. It's just putting your name out there and getting it. So like, you know, I have no delusions that I'm about to make a film at Blumhouse. I've made one short film, but it's something like it would be nice to go back five years from now when I have a couple more under my belt and go, yeah, we actually met outside of Screamfest. And like, you know, how can you forget Halloween Ends? Uh, That was one of your huge movies that was playing. Um, So it's that that's what I was, you know, it just would have been good to to shake his hand or something but at the same right. time i'm like i don't want to be that guy you can't keep making my short film um jason blum make your blum <laughs> well i i i mean i in your shoes i would have been way too scared too the idea of like going up to celebrities makes me nervous yeah. but jason blum he funds a lot of small low budget horror movies so it is exactly. perfectly <laughs> in the realm of possibility for him to fund a mitch oliver film especially after the druid's hand which is super cool Thanks, man. Yeah, some someday, hopefully, because that's the, that's the big company making them right now, you know. So, um, yeah, that would be you awesome. Could but... Do a collab album. Yes, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like with that being said, they oh, I met Casper Van Dien. Fucking what? Uh, yeah, Casper nice. Van Dien was there. 
uh starship were you troopers. carrying around your yeah your uh emergency starship troopers dvd <laughs> i was not but he oh, was there uh he was in a film called mad heidi which is a swiss exploitation film that you guys both need to watch the trailer for it because it is fucking insane um met the filmmakers they're great guys they flew in from switzerland like that was the coolest part about screen fest is people were from all over the world and um it was just I really honestly cool would talk. be like more excited to see casper van d and like holy shit well, that, and then me, me and jesse were at like scream fest treats you so well like we were at like rooftop parties almost every there was like four of them like where it was like all film private filmmaker events you go and network and meet each other and just talk they feed you drinks like it's all free they, they give you food drinks they just treat you like gold and me and jesse are on this rooftop on hollywood boulevard and i look over i'm like oh my god that's fucking han he's like han han what i was like that's han from fast and the furious and han from fast and the furious was like standing like five feet away from me he was premiering his film there um but yeah that's that's my rant about scream fest i just wanted to get that out of the way because i'm sure some people are interested in hearing about it uh but i'll do an episode with jesse and we'll talk more about the whole experience but i want to share those stories with you casper right. Dean, sleepy hollow fame and I was going to say, I know you just rewatched Sleepy yeah. Hollow too. So that's yeah. extra awesome. Jesse yeah. didn't say anything to uh, Jason Blum either. Like he didn't. Jesse doesn't know who Jason Blum is. Like, he knows who he is, but he doesn't know what he I don't think he knows what he looks. Okay. I don't know. Because I was like, you had backup on this and you both fumbled. Yeah. But that's uh, Jesse was a fucking rock star out there, though. That's what I'll say. Like Jesse, it was so nice having him there because he was going up to everyone like he broke the ice so many times to just meet other people. That's what you go to these events for is to, you know, network and get to know other people. And Jesse was a pro. I was very proud of him. And I'm very happy I wasn't there alone because I was there. By the time I was there alone, I was alone in Hollywood for four days. By that time, I had made really good friends with some of the filmmakers. So it was nice. I could go hang out with them. Uh, shout out Nathan. Shout out Ludwig. Our friend Ludwig is he he made this incredible short film. And then I look up his IMDb and it's like he directed the Tony Hawk's Pro Skater uh, video game documentary. And he's like what? friends with Tony Hawk and he's in a Tony Hawk Pro Skater cover band <laughs> called uh, the Uphill Jam. It's crazy. Um, or Downhill Jam, I think. Yeah, there. It's awesome. Wow. But this guy is very based. Yeah, but shout out. I'm going to talk about a few screenings that I did see there, though, that I think are they're going to be making their way. It's either Shutter or other streaming platforms that you'll be able to check out on. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's kick off with Halloween ends because I want to get this uh, get this out of the way. I was very happy that we could bring on. It was important to bring on Daniel for this, too, because I want to have a well-rounded conversation about a movie that the world is fucking freaking out about. <laughs> um like people are pissed some people love it some people think it's the worst thing ever made uh let's kick it to um, let's kick it to boozy first oh about halloween ends yeah because so the like, year you've become quite the halloween mark like a uh, yeah a halloweener yeah um yeah so i went on opening night me and my roommate went we were very excited um and I left uh, feeling how I felt after uh, the last Jurassic Park movie. Holy shit. Yeah, I fucking hated it. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I feel like I, I understand why people like it. And I've seen a lot of, of uh, good, good banter about its merit and everything. But I, I feel like a, a story that has spent so much time not, o- like not only being about dealing with evil, but at the core base of talking about Laurie and Michael and just having like a very anticlimactic ending, aside from a cool scene involving a trash compactor. Oh, yeah. I, the, yeah. The, cool, the cool scene for me was the opening. I was fucking losing my shit laughing yeah, at that Yeah, opening. that was an awesome homage. <laughs> Yeah, I, I saw it at the Chinese theater, like in the big IMAX screen. That's where I know, Daniel, I can't remember what movie you said you saw there, but you're like, any movie would be amazing in that. It theater. was Creed 2, and it <laughs> felt like the greatest movie I'd ever seen in my life. Yeah, so I didn't have that experience, but I did. I, I will say I definitely don't hate this movie as much as everyone else does. Uh, to be completely honest, it's probably my favorite of the three. Uh, but that's not saying much because I'm not a fan of the other ones. Like, I just need to, I've been battling it for so long. I always like, you know, 2018 tore me apart i was like i want to love it so much but i just couldn't and kills i was even like thinking back on when we had recorded our episode i tried really hard to like and there are things about it that i like and there's things i like about ends but 
the, the franchise, this, this trilogy, it's just not for me. Um, but I understand why people are pissed. I think that, um, like at the risk of sounding like an asshole, I think that the, the people behind it think that they were a little more clever than they are. Uh, because I, one thing that's kind of an irritating me about this is people saying that it's original and that it's something new. It's like, uh, no, this is Friday the 13th part five. This is Halloween, the curse <laughs> of Michael Myers. And not to mention the kid's name is fucking Corey Cunningham. I'm like, oh man, it just, there was parts of the movie that I missed because my eyes were rolled to the back of my head. Uh, but, <laughs> but there were parts that I really loved. Specifically, there's one part with uh, Lori walking out of a grocery store and she runs into like a victim from the Halloween Kills. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Like, this is something that was a good way to add depth to the community. I like that. Too. Yeah, that and, and I saw what they were going for with with Corey. And like, uh, I think that if this would have been the second one and then they had a third, you know, the final wrap up, we would be having a much different conversation right mm -hmm. now. Uh, but as as the finale of Michael Myers, it's pretty uh, understandable why people are choked. But yeah, but Daniel, I know uh you're you you dug it let's hear about it well uh let me explain by saying i hated the marketing of this movie and i was kind of dreading the movie based on the marketing because and i said this on schlock and all podcast a while ago that i felt like the marketing looked like batman versus superman it was like Lori v michael who's yeah. gonna come out on top clash <laughs> of the titans and i'm so not interested in that i think yeah. the Lori versus michael storyline has run out of gas long ago yeah. i'm so disinterested in it um, but I started to hear rumblings that this movie was weird and that nobody's going to be able to predict where it goes. And I was starting to get excited. Um, I got to, I, I had a great experience going to see the movie because my legendary friend, Chris Hurtado and I live in different States at this point. Um, but we came together to the same point for a wedding and we got to see it at an Alamo draft house with a few other of our friends. And it was kind of just a great experience going to see it for that. And I really liked the movie because I was so relieved that it was not the movie I expected. I was so relieved it wasn't just Michael versus Lori fighting for two hours, because that just sounds terribly boring to me. And I feel like a lot of people are not thinking about how, if you're going to keep these movies going, they need plots. And I feel like nobody wants Halloween movies to have plots. They just want Michael to walk around and kill people. And we just got that for Halloween Kills. It's nothing but Michael walking around killing people. So um, this movie was something new, something different. It was the first time I watched one of these hollow green movies where I liked the characters and I was interested in them. I really liked following Corey. This was the first one where I really liked Lori as well as her granddaughter, whose name is escaping me. I think Allison. Andy Manichek's character, yeah, Allison. Allison yeah. yeah, I liked her. Um, but I will say, I rewatched the movie on Peacock last night and I liked it less. Yeah. Uh, it makes very little sense. <laughs> it is, <laughs> It is a it is a sloppy movie on most narrative counts but i still find it entertaining and i'm just glad we got something different because halloween kills was just so boring to me so give me some kind of a plot and this movie did yeah yeah no i think i'm pretty much in the the same boat it's i i just like my big problem with it too is obviously it's a, on a script standpoint it's the narrative of the whole thing it is like you said sloppy and uh, I could have done without the Laurie Strode Sex in the City monologues. Um, <laughs> she's just basically talking oh, over man. the whole fuck. And like the dialogue is just so, so corny. But uh, but that's a part of it. It's, you know, we're at what, like the 10th fucking Halloween movie at this point. Um, 13. Yeah, 13. And I will say the the big thing that came out of this, and I'm admitting this now to Daniel, who I know is a fan. Uh, the biggest thing I've taken away from this Halloween trilogy is I am one of those people that it has made me realize just how not horrible Rob Zombie's movies are. Because <laughs> at least Rob Zombie's movies have style. Um, specifically, two I actually do like two, but the even the first one, you know, I'm still not a fan, but it's like, at least to me, that was doing something different. And, you know, it felt like a completely different franchise, which, you know, is either a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you feel about how you want sequels or remakes and stuff like that. Uh, but this one's just, I don't know if it wasn't the biggest franchise right now, it would be so forgettable for me. Like it's, it's really sad for me that I wasn't like crazy excited for it. Um, but I'm happy that there are people out there who do like it. Uh, people who are really, really mad, calm down. It's going to be okay. 
it will be fine. They're going to make another Michael movie someday. We'll get our reboot it's, trilogy in yeah, a like decade. It's, it's not the end of the world. Um, but yeah, I did. Bottom line, love the intro of that movie. The kid just getting gooned was awesome. It's <laughs> an incredible opening. It's, it's so, maybe the best scene in this whole trilogy, actually. It, totally. And and how it cuts to like the Halloween three season, the witch like font. I love that. Like, uh, yeah. when Halloween ends kicks in. Did anyone so. find it weird that a, a guy who can legally buy alcohol uh, gets bullied by everyone <laughs> younger than him? Yes. Okay. That was something I noticed on a rewatch because I did rewatch I, it. And, like, I, those I, are the... I was like adding up their age halfway through because I'm like, wait, he can buy alcohol and these kids can't. So I was like, well, I'm assuming that he's at least 21. But then they like talk about how old he was when the accident happened. I was like, yeah. wait, he's like 23. The bullies, the bullying scenes are so painful, and that's hey, it's one it, nerd. It's, it's one hey, of my, teenagers can be mean, man. So, true, but it's I one love of how my, it's the most eclectic group of people too. It's like we got everyone in this group. Yeah, it's just it's one of that's they're one of my in the puppies. marching band. <laughs> yeah, because David Gordon Green knows it's the nerds who are the real problem. It's Nerd true. rage is real. Yeah. <laughs> No, um, I, that being said, too, I think people got to calm the fuck down on the the hate and vitriol going towards the actor who plays Corey because he did a perfectly fine job. He's so um, good. Yeah, he's great. And uh, what the one thing that's really annoying me, and they do it in the movie, too, is people are talking about how ugly he is. I'm like, what? Is, what grow up. How are you fucking saying that as a grown adult <laughs> shitting on someone for it? And not not only is he not ugly, he's a good looking guy. I like I don't know. I just saw it as. I think it's just gross that people are commenting on his his looks and being like he would never this would never happen blah blah so shut the fuck up uh yeah that's my rant yeah it's a shame I I actually feel like this would be a better movie if Michael just wasn't in it and it just focused on Corey because it's all the Corey stuff that works for me and the Michael stuff none of it makes any sense the more I think about it I'm like what what how how did these things go together he became the most Scooby-Doo villain ever it, it, that it, like the whole they both have the masks which i know is a stupid little nitpick but it's like oh so he got the sewer rat melted down look twice like I, I don't know it just that pissed me off but i cannot tell you i was jumping out of my seat when i noticed what they were when it was coming together what they're fucking doing and it was they replicate a shot from the opening of the curse of michael myers going into the sewer i was like no fucking way no fucking way are they doing the cult of thorn and they essentially it it is the cult of thorn but not like it's just not called it um but cult of like, thorn was my main hope going into this movie yeah. i wanted cult oh, of thorn yes. I, oh and that's the other thing can you imagine they tried to get paul rudd back can you imagine if he actually did come back <laughs> was, was it would have been busy so doing crazy. ant-man 6 well he's Probably. just too busy having a real career and doesn't need to go back <laughs> doesn't need to go to a fucking back to the the well of a movie that he has been hated on for years like it was his first movie and everyone hates curse of michael myers i don't but i fucking uh, love curse was he like yeah. the Corey cunningham of his time yeah he, he totally was and uh i don't know i i just couldn't believe that when i saw what they were doing i'm like no way no uh, that and that was what made me like parts of it was i was like yeah it is they took some swings did the swings pay off i don't know i don't think so at this point judging by the way that you know people are reacting to it but if there's one thing we know about horror is that people are always going to go back to these films and revisit them and look for something like who would have known that we would be talking about spookies all these years later and be like it's actually a pretty fucking wild movie (laughs) it's a great episode by the way i loved it thank Thank you. you thanks man um yeah i think that we would, should we put a pin on is there anything else you want to say Busy? i have one more comment and i, I just kind of want to ask daniel is like i know you said you liked uh laurie in this in in the in, in ends i feel like oh, so much of her dialogue she felt like such a background character to her own movie and all of her dialogue she is felt, in most of these halloween mm-hmm. movies but she felt like all her dialogue compared to like how resilient she was it, or was built up to be in the other ones i felt like this one she was either like replaced with a clone or given like npc dialogue it just felt no. so, that's a it, running theme through these movies. Yeah, they all true. have really bad dialogue. Yeah. Like, you just kind of got to get used to it or something. But I, I feel yeah. like her tone, at least in the other ones, you're like, okay, she was like showing some kind of emotion. This one, I just felt like she was so neutered for most of it. 
I guess I like that she calmed down a little bit because she was a yeah. little bit much for me in the first two. She's so nervous. Yeah, no, I, I get where you're coming with that. It just felt like such a complete. It, it was like uh, maybe she was on some kind of meds, like she was on like Ritalin, so like everything was just kind of mid. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know about that. But I, you know, I will say that if you're a person who really loves these first two hollow green movies, I completely understand why you don't like this, but I went into it as a person who don't really, doesn't really care about those movies. And I was like, Oh, thank you for doing something different. Like I just didn't want to see the same movie again. Yeah. Tell me about those cherry blossoms. (laughs) Those scenes are great. I love those scenes between Jamie Lee Curtis and Will Patton. They're just big as had a cute romance in this movie, which I really like. How big It it had weird eighties rom-com stuff through it. Especially like the motorcycle stuff. I love the motorcycle stuff. Synth wave over top of it. It would be great. It's an incel story about a guy who's consistently being fawned over. Like that's, it's so like him every time he's just like, no, you can't fix me. No, it's just like, (laughs) Oh, I don't know. That drove me nuts. I, I but... feel like if Allison knew how much she was getting bullied by like minors, she might not be as <laughs> interested. But he's got a motorcycle, so he looks exactly. like a badass, even though he's not really. But he can wrestle Michael Myers to the ground. Yes. So he's got that going for him. True. True. Are we spoiling uh, too much? I, I yeah. realize we didn't give spoiler warnings. We didn't, but at the same time, if you're listening Never to this, it, Halloween ends, man. Like it's everyone's everyone yeah, should have seen it talk by this point. even if you can't even if you're not yeah. comfortable going to a movie theater you can still see it it's on peacock yeah. so yeah for sure um all right let's uh let's move on let's see what else you guys have watched uh daniel you want to tell us about something you've you've taken a look at sure yeah you know one of my favorite things about the terror table is you guys are great about keeping up with modern indie horror so i did want to talk about one that i watched i don't know if you guys have seen yet have you guys seen deadstream went straight to shut oh uh, not yet i've seen so many people talking yeah. about this i haven't seen it they yet. did a they did one of the segments on vhs 99 as mm-hmm. well like the they did makers. and have i think you guys did, talk about vhs 99 on the pod yet ha, i mean i, I started to today okay you've seen oh, it okay. you guys can yeah, do I've that i i started it on friday but i was just so tired that i wanted to give it the proper attention so mm-hmm. i'm gonna i'm hoping to watch it today actually but sorry cool deadstream yeah, I mean, the, su- the success of Deadstream for me is particularly uh, impressive because it's it's normally the kind of movie I don't think I would be into because it's a mm-hmm. found footage movie with almost one actor, not quite, but pretty close to one actor through the whole movie. And that's not my kind of movie, really, but um, it really worked for me. It's directed by Joseph and Vanessa Winter. Love it when married couples uh, work as a team on movies. I think that's really, really cool. Shut um, up, but Flanagan. He- yeah, absolutely. Him and Robin Sherry Moon Zombie. There's a lot of them. Um, but anyway, the he plays this YouTube influencer who is purposefully very, very annoying. Uh, he's such a douchebag, but um, he goes into a haunted house, live streams it, and it turns out, of course, the house is actually haunted. Um, but the horror of it is just so wacky. It gets compared to Evil Dead 2 a lot, and those comparisons uh do make sense but i think it definitely has enough originality to it and Mm -hmm. monsters and creature effects of the likes you probably haven't really seen before um it's just really consistently entertaining for 87 minutes when it ended i felt like i had a buzz going like it was just kind of a kind of a high so deadstream is really fun i definitely recommend it so you're you're saying there's still milk in the tank of the uh found footage there's still something in there oh there always i think so yeah, yeah. there always there always will be and like that's what yeah that's generally what i've heard about this one is exactly what you said is that like you hear the premise and you're like oh god that sounds annoying but they yeah. do something cool with it and i think uh judging on how you guys talk about vhs 99 you guys are going to decide what i'm watching this afternoon uh because it's either going to be deadstream or vhs 99 um yeah that sounds really cool i'm looking forward to checking it out boozy do you want to talk about one now well, I was going to say, let's just piggyback off that and talk about VHS 99. We don't have to uh, go that in depth since it's so fresh. That yeah. People haven't really got a chance to check it out. Daniel, I'll let you go first. Yeah, VHS 99. Um, I, I These VHS movies are usually such a mixed bag for me, but I am always looking forward to seeing another one because there's just such an air of anything could happen in these movies and you can just Mm -hmm. be walking into absolutely anything and the curiosity always gets the best of me um i like the first two okay uh there are certain segments i love certain ones i really don't like i never saw viral i didn't like vhs 94 very much with that except uh, hail ratma i love ratma um this i think is my favorite vhs movie i think it's the most consistent there's no bad segments 
I think there's two segments that are truly great. And that's the one from Joseph and Vanessa Winter and from Johannes Roberts. Um, Ooh, Uzi those Lohan. two, oh my God, they're two of the most fun horror anthology segments I've seen in a long time. And the rest of them are still pretty fun. And like, there's nothing bad in this movie at all. So I was a big, big fan. I really liked it question one of the ones that you're talking about is it i have just heard and i that's why i don't think it's a spoiler because especially in terms of these movies people always talk about like the just the general plot of what each one is yeah the one that's piqued my interest most is it's found footage but literally in hell that's the joseph and vanessa winter one okay i am so excited to see that because i hear that kind of shit and it raises the hairs on my body with excitement because like i love the audacity <laughs> thinking about seriously like, let's make a that's how I felt. movie in hell <laughs> it's so awesome. audacious because like yeah. the, the johannes roberts one is like a typical horror anthology like creep show tales from the crypt kind of thing just done really really well but then that one is so inventive and audacious it's yeah. really really impressive that they went there awesome boozy what were your thoughts on it you're a big fan of this franchise yeah, and I, I actually, having mulled it over quite a bit, I found that, like, 94 is my favorite. I, I just feel that, like, the strong segments are really strong and the weak ones aren't that weak. Um, so going into this one, I was super excited. Like, I watched this the first day it came out. And I, uh, I feel kind of the complete opposite. Not that I, I hate these segments or think that they're not well done. I, it's, I think it's just, and, and maybe that's, that's why people like it is I, it's so much different than 94. I feel like it's uh, a lot, how do I put it? I, I feel like it was, it had more comedy in this one and it was a little more fun. And you know, you how hate I, horror I hate comedy. You. Yeah, I, I really do. And that's what uh, uh, I'm not sure if you watch one that like like my favorite horror movie of the year this year. I'm just dying to know what Boozy thinks of it because uh, it's what I'm not sure if you're going to talk about it. But I just know that you, I'm curious because you seem to not like anything that has some kind of like comedy or mm -hmm. heart. <laughs> yeah, like you, no, you like the dark shit. Yeah, and I do. that wasn't and a I, dig. I, that's and that's uh, and that's that's not like a detriment to 99. That's just my personal preference, and it just it felt like that. Uh, with how dark 94 was that it didn't carry the same energy over and I, I found that the opening segment with the army men just really took it out right away for me because it I, I understand it's a nothing of a wraparound it uh, yeah and I, I think yeah. I think that was like a, a big bummer is it it really it kind of comes out like curtains blazing and then it's just not like a, a huge fart but just a little like a little tiny one and because it, it really you're starting to, to be like, well, how are the wheels turning that this is going to wrap itself? All it is is like these figures. And it just imagine Boozy writing for Bloody Disgusting. Where it's not like a big <laughs> fart. It's just a little, little tiny one. <laughs> <laughs> it's silent, but deadly. I don't know. It, it just is it like da, 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 just like a little, a little toot. Um, but yeah there there's some wild fucking segments especially the the game show one i i can't remember yeah. the name of that one it's I, just it's so bizarre it's uh oh uh so I, i'm not oh, yeah, talking 100%. about it. i'm not talking about it until i finish it but i did start it and i saw so i know what you're talking about the army soldiers and i actually like i'm into it so far uh yeah. i just like was too tired and i want to give it i'm going to start it over but that is straight up canadian television programming with oh, yeah, wink yahoo uh oh and it's so creepy how kids are getting covered in slime and shit and like i'm so nostalgic for the year 1999 uh and like that's why i kind of like the army men thing because you know i'm not meaning this to sound like a verb but it's quite columbine like it's like this right. was around that time of like where you know i i felt like from what i saw it's very authentic to the time and they did a really mm -hmm. good job of like you know putting everyone in like the the clothing and uh like it's one of my dreams to make out it's so weird that this came out and i know it's going to end up happening is uh you know people are going to start looking back on the year 2000 in the way that we talk about the 80s or like there's just a, there's stuff to to mine from that era mm -hmm. and like it's my dream to make like a horror movie set in 1999 that has like yak packs and devil sticks and stack cups <laughs> like you know all the the crazy 90s tv commercials for kids toys like wait wait are you telling me stack cups had two like 
peaks within our lifetime already because that shit was hot like a little while ago too they came back i didn't know they came back i love stack ups those are Um, great i i think the other thing that like they do touch on a little bit is the the millennium and the kind of millennium panic i just i wanted them to lean into it a little bit harder but i think it's uh I don't want to say iconic is a strong word, but I I loved the scene where they just had the granny in the chair. Like it was a a home recording and she's got the 2000s glasses on. Mm -hmm. And then just like how strange it goes from there after. I just, I thought that was really comical. That's awesome. Yeah. So it sounds like uh, you still took something from it. And Daniel is a fan. Uh, I'm I'm looking forward to checking that one out. Uh, I'm going to knock one off. I'll do a... A screening that I saw at Screamfest, which was a documentary called "Living with Chucky," and this is the oh doc- yeah awesome yeah documentary on the Chucky franchise, and it was made by Kyra Gardner, who's the daughter of Tony Gardner, who did famously did the makeup and makeup effects for movies like Hocus Pocus, and he went on to he hopped on board the Chucky franchise, I believe at Seed. Yes, it was Seed of Chucky is where he came in, and he's been with them ever since. Um, so you, you see the film through, it's, it's really two different kinds of films. It, it does feel very much like a never sleep again type documentary. At first they go through each movie and like, you know, talk about the importance of them and have interviews. Also, I met Tom Holland. I haven't even posted about that. Like, uh, Fright Night, Tom Holland. I bought his book and got an autograph and he directed Child's Play one. So he's, he's in it a bit. And, uh, it's really interesting. Like, you know, I love that franchise. It's maybe my, I think the most consistent franchise out of all the horror franchises. Like I have fun throughout, even at the ones that I don't, even the one that I like probably the least, I still find very watchable. Uh, so I'm a big Chucky fan. And yeah, it was really, the documentary is really good. It's really good. It's just, uh, I think where people are going to have a bit of where it's going to have a bit of a divide is by the time they start getting into seed of Chucky, which also they really speed through three, which kind of bums me out. Cause I know Daniel <laughs> is another one of the only other people that agrees. I like child's play three. Um, Heck I'm yeah. A, yeah. I'm a fan of that movie. Like I obviously two is my favorite by far for nostalgic reasons. And also I just think it's a great horror movie. Uh, but three has so many awesome moments and it took some swings that were really wild for the time. Um, you know, a movie that came out a year after the second one and they jump forward fucking like eight years and all of a sudden Andy's in military school and shit. Like I thought it was, I thought it was interesting, but by the last, the last like 45 minutes of the movie really does become heavily about the family that's behind Chucky. So like Don Mancini, um, Brad Dorif, Fiona Dorif, uh, Kyra Gardner, all these people that played uh, Jennifer Tilly. There's a lot of like really funny interviews with specifically jennifer tilly she's great and um but it really turns into like oh it's hard work making these movies and it's like everyone knows that that it's like yeah you work 15 hour days and you don't see your kids and it becomes kind of a lot about the filmmaking process and i think that that's where the doc could have just been better focused on the series and the franchise but that's obviously not what they were really going for uh, I just think that that is going to be where people are going to have a bit of a divide. It's, it really is like never sleep again is one of my favorite documentaries ever. And uh, it's so good throughout, but it's very focused on the franchise and the movies themselves. And uh, it loses a bit of steam at the end. It gets, it gets a little like very sad. And I'm like, I don't know if we Interesting. Need, needed this. Yeah. Like it ends with a whimper. Well, it, well, it's not even that. It's like, I think it's meant to be heart, which it is. Um, but it's like, you know, Kyra is talking a lot about how she didn't. There were every time that a new Chucky movie was being made, she hated it because it meant that her dad was going to be in Toronto and he wasn't going to be at home and he was going to miss her birthday and stuff like that. And I think that those are stories that, you know, they're worth being told, but they spent quite a bit of time on it. And I'm like, motherfucker, talk more about Child's Play 3. <laughs> <laughs> well at that point it could kind of be about anything so i yeah. see the disappointment there that it's if it's just about it's hard to make movies it's not really about the chucky movies anymore do you think are they doing that because they want to kind of say hey before you criticize like cult of chucky just remember that this was hard to make and we put a lot yeah, a of li- work into it a little a little bit but that's where you know a bit of my cynicism will come out and saying that like you know obviously they don't talk about the remake at all like they pre- just don't and it's notorious don mancini pretends it doesn't exist 
I fucking love that remake. I think it's awesome. Um, but like they they don't talk about that. The film was they don't even mention the Chucky TV series, uh, which is that's weird. A very interesting because I think she had made this for a film school project, and I think it's been like done and they've been like editing it together for like five years like it's been a long time there's clearly a lot of footage there uh but i think it's like you could have got, gone back and shown like we got the tv series now and like there's some more interesting stuff that f- the franchise still has like just acknowledge that the franchise is still going yeah well and like that's the thing is all this whole team is all working on that series so i think it was just very much a they wanted to just get it done and put it out um but yeah it, it definitely uh, I just I love the franchise, so I had a gigantic smile on my face for you know seventy percent of that movie, and then it, I still enjoyed those parts. I just think generally looking at it from you know if I wasn't someone who was interested in the filmmaking process, if you wanted to make a movie all about that, then it should have been like that from the beginning. Um, it just it has a bit of a switch there. I hope I don't come off as negative on this though, because I did really enjoy it. Like I gave it three and a half on Letterbox. I will watch it again. Um, I highly recommend it to anyone who's a child's play fan or people who just love those making of documentaries where they get really in depth. Um, yeah. So that is living with Chucky. Daniel, you got anything else? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll piggyback a couple of movies that go well together. I saw two Todd Browning movies for the first time this season, uh, who Todd Browning, who made the original Dracula and uh, freaks as well. And uh, the first one is Mark of the Vampire, which just got a Blu-ray release from Warner Archive. I wanted to see this movie for so long, and I guess I was just kind of holding out for a good way to see it. Um, So I got the Warner Archive Blu-ray right away. And this is from 1935. It's also starring Bela Lugosi. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a sad thing in horror history that while the sequels to Dracula are good, uh, they don't have Bela Lugosi. So we never got a Bela Lugosi Dracula sequel. Um, And this movie kind of works as that for a while because it's Bela Lugosi as a vampire. Um, He has this vampire bride who is very, very creepy, probably creepier than him. And then it's also starring Lionel Barrymore and Lionel Atwell. And for a while, it, it plays a lot like Dracula, except his vampire bride plays into the story much more. And it is such a good gothic vampire movie it's got maybe even like better gothic imagery than dracula it's kind of todd browning building on that and going bigger with it um there's so many cool just crazy cool gothic horror shots in this i will say for people who want to check it out it has a twist that is not satisfying and doesn't make very much sense so that's kind of a bummer but the rest of the movie is so good i definitely recommend it I'm, and I'm checking he... out some images. Sorry, not to cut you off here. Oh, I'm no, checking out some it, images on uh, the old internet. This seems really cool. I, I like it's a really lot of cool this looking. imagery. Uh, I I do have to say though, just looking at what the uh, Blu-ray release cover, they could have they could have uh, spruced it up a little bit. I like it. I think it's cool. I like the original poster art, and they because I think especially with older movies mm-hmm. that tends to look better than like original slipcover art. I know Mitch has thoughts about like Scream Scream Factory slipcover art, so some of them. I imagine I wouldn't get much pushback. I, on I just that. love seeing the creativity that someone can bring to some of those because sometimes you can uh, bring people into watching things or buying things by just having a little bit so, something different. That's how I got into the gate too. Um, it, but yeah, the, exactly. I, I've gotten I, caught on a lot of Tubi movies that way. I love those uh, those old school like you know old school hollywood horror posters so, so i'm looking at the blu-ray here and i i think i'm on daniel's side and this one like i like that kind of stuff but i know what you mean um yeah i haven't seen this one i want to check it out yeah i add this to my list i uh watch a lot of this has been like this has been my really my halloween season is you know movies that are stuff that would be talked about on cobwebs is uh you know i've really that's what gets me into the halloween spirit this year is watching like you know showing my roommate like mark uh mask of the red death and old vincent price movies that i love so much so that's cool yeah and i love using this season to kind of seek out the ones that i haven't seen because it's a it's a limited pool they're not going to make any more 1930s and 40s (laughs) horror movies so you gotta hey maybe they'll uncover something in a vault that that would be great uh london after midnight let's find it yeah that would be great um, the other one I'll just touch on real briefly, it's The Devil Doll, and it's also starring Lionel Barrymore, who was Mr. Potter in It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, that's probably where most people would know him. 
but this is a just bug nuts bonkers horror movie it's about these these guys that escape from prison and one of them is a scientist and he's created a way to turn people small like six inches in height but he can't figure out a way to shrink them. He's doing it because he's like, well, we'll have an unlimited food supply if people only need a tiny bit of food. Um, but he can't figure out a way to make their brains still work once he's shrunk them. Oh, I so thought once you he meant he was going to eat the people. No. <laughs> once he shrinks them, he can control them with his mind, but he can't give them free will. And that guy dies. And Lionel Barrymore then takes the experiment and uses it to take revenge on the people who framed him and got him into prison. It's a crazy movie, but it also like has this really uh, meaningful, emotional heart to it that I was surprised. And by the last scene, you almost feel like you're watching a Frank Capra movie and you're like, wait, I, I just watched these tiny little people kill somebody in an earlier scene. Um, Todd Browning's a weirdo and it's a weird movie, but I really like it. And I'm really hoping Warner Archive puts that on Blu-ray soon because this is definitely the kind of stuff they've been doing lately. Awesome. The Mark of the Vampire and the Devil Doll. That's cool. Uh, yeah, Boozy, do you, uh, do you want to talk about something else? Yeah, I have something very fun and exciting to talk about that I'm very excited about. I have never jumped into the Wishmaster series. Oh, yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I just, I, I have watched one and two so far. And I will say that that one is kind of slower paced and I, I feel like doesn't entirely know where it wants to go two is truly a shining light it oh felt, my god oh what man the fuck <laughs> two reminded me of like terminator 2 i straight up it was so fun I, I think that it reminded me a little bit like the the guy who plays the djinn when he's in human form it it's like a slapstick version of demon knight a demon knight's pretty slapstick too at times no um, but like i i feel like the the billy zane character yeah. and this character like have some similarities in terms of it's kind of serious at certain points and like threatening and then it just goes really wonky i cannot believe that take <laughs> <laughs> wishmaster 2 i had so much fun watching wishmaster 2 man it, not wishmaster like i think wishmaster 1 is a fucking blast like that it's movie so is good. so wild it's so wild it, i don't know if i've ever made it through to <laughs> oh man i've never tried to watch any of the sequels because i've never ever heard a single good thing about any of them <laughs> and i love the first wishmaster i've watched it many times so thank you boozy you finally yeah. given me motivation to pop in my best drawn blu-ray of wishmaster 2 i i would love to hear what you think about it i don't know it just it felt oddly charming to me and i want to continue with this franchise now i i it's oh. hard to take this franchise seriously just overall You're not supposed but... to yeah, but like, yeah, I don't I mean, know. Andrew Devoff clearly so tells you fun. you are watching camp right now. Yeah. Yeah. I, but, I just, I love it. I feel like they're doing such a good job of making this Jin character just more and more aggressive and weird. And yeah, I just overall, I loved it. Wild. That's awesome. Well, maybe I'm going to have to, well, we should do a Wishmaster series sometime. I, I, I hope know. that like someone's going like, I, there's a 2B analyst going like, why the fuck are our stats on Wishmaster 2 going <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It went from zero the last six years to like five. Oh my Would you God. say Wishmaster 2 is the Terrifier 2 of the Wishmaster franchise? Oh God. Well, I, I can't say that for sure because I've only seen one and two. So, but like, I don't know. I, I feel like two, I guess, would be a good comparison. Like they... they, they... <laughs> Are you I, saying I think they there's up, like they five the Wishmasters? Ante? They did up the end. I found that the kills were a lot more gruesome. I feel like they gave a little bit more budget to it overall. Wild. Oh my god. Okay, I need to watch Wishmaster too. Um, I'm just gonna get flooded with like you're a fucking moron. No, that's what people come to the tear table for. Those. This is the only place you can find Boozy's takes on Wishmaster Two being the Terminator Two of the Wishmaster. <laughs> oh my Quote god. It. Yes, uh, box cover if it didn't come out 20 years ago. Um, <laughs> all right, yeah, so that's Wishmaster 2. I'm quickly just going to hop on a movie that I've, I'm sure I've talked about on the show before because it's a classic, talked about many times, saw The Lost Boys uh, on the nice. big screen with uh, Jason Patrick in attendance, and that Q&A was uh, 
was conflicting for me because there was moments where I'm like, oh my God, I love him so much. And then there's moments where it's like, God damn, this man is out of touch. <laughs> like he, <laughs> he said, what I'll say in the positives is, okay, first off, if anyone out there ever has the opportunity, if you think you've seen Lost Boys, but you've never seen it in a theater with a crowd, you haven't seen the Lost Boys. It works so much better with an audience. It's one of the best examples of movies that I've ever seen that I've seen multiple times at home. And this was the first time in the theater. And I can't even tell you how it's like, it's a different movie when you see it with an audience because it's so much fun. It's so, it's goofy. It's genuinely scary at a couple moments. And uh, Schumacher's vision is just f- at full, full steam in this movie. Like he's so good. His vision for this movie is why it works so well. And that's something that uh, Jason Patrick talks about a lot. Like when he was at the, doing the Q&A, yeah, he he said a lot of really nice things about him, and like there's some cool tidbits that I'm just not going to share because I'm not that's not interesting for other people. But the movie's great. Uh, Jason Patrick did say he's like, well, this was the movie that actually invented like there wasn't soundtracks to movies before. Oh my god, Lost Boys, I'm like, <laughs> motherfucker! What are you talking? About? 1987 yeah. invented soundtracks. Yeah, yeah, they didn't they didn't think of it before then. It was a oh, foreign concept. And he he took no he held no punches and talking about how much he hates everything new and like you oh. know all like you know they even they were alluding to like the hell like you know Brian Collins was the one who was hosting the Q and A and he was like um, would you have any interest in doing like you know there's a lot of talks about legacy sequels and like bringing the Lost Boys back would you ever go into it and he's like no nah, sh- shit's all crap it's all crap it's like you're saying that because you know it's never gonna happen you're never gonna be asked to, <laughs> to come back like jason patrick is uh he's great he's amazing in the movie he's so good in that movie and he's amazing in sleepers i think he's a great actor um but i'm gonna move on from that lost boys rules uh huge fan bigger fan than ever after watching it on the big screen so uh, and i know the saskatoon fantastic film festival is doing a lost boys drunken cinema sure uh, presentation of it so make sure you make your make your way out for that Uh, because that's a movie that would actually work really well with drunken cinema i know i didn't love the nightmare on elm street drunken cinema because i don't like people laughing at that movie Um, yeah that movie is way too grim for that yeah and you know like that's why i just don't think it like i think drunken cinema would be great for the lost boys because it's like the the comedy is so intentional and so like in your face and all the like the cheese of it like the sax man it's like none of it is like hateful laughter at the movie or like yeah oh my god this is stupid this is bad um it's just a great it's all intentional it's a great movie yeah Uh, let me let me ask you this because our our friends uh matt bledsoe and carmelita valdez just did a podcast of the film feast podcast on lost boys and they had disagreement about how they feel about the quarries so how do you feel about the quarries in this movie do you like them or do you hate them oh i love them but that's i do too yeah i think that that's they're supposed to be like little dipshits and especially like edgar frog is I, probably my favorite character in the whole movie like cory feldman uh where he's just like this grizzled veteran like war veteran back from Nam, but he knows about vampires and, except like, he's like 15 years old <laughs> exactly he's like <laughs> wise far beyond his age um and it's all bullshit it comes from you know knowledge of comic books and horror movies <laughs> and uh i that, i love that character and Haim Haim's the heartbeat of the movie like Haim i is, love cory Haim and everything yeah yeah and he's so good like the classic line you drank someone's blood are you crazy like, <laughs> it's just such 80s cult pulpy oh i love it i i need to i haven't listened to that episode yet i'm curious if i'm gonna have to argue with matt on that one or Carmelita. no matt, matt is pro Corey's. carmelita oh, okay. is very anti Corey's, and she says I'm speaking for her, but she feels like the ending is a tragedy because she wants the vampires to kill all the good people. Oh, I disagree with that. But I, <laughs> and I love listening to Carmelita. Like, she's amazing. But Carmelita also loves Alien 3 and Exorcist 2. So um, <laughs> <laughs> we're going to, we, it's, it's great when everyone has, you know, just different opinions and it, it's fun, you know, discussing those. So uh, yeah, either way, that was The Lost Boys. Does anyone else have anything else they want to talk about? Well, Mitch, I saw on, I thought I saw on Letterboxd, you started the Cabinet of Curiosities. Yes, sir. And I just started it last night, too. Awesome. I'm curious about this. How are you guys feeling about it? You're curious about the Curiosities? Yeah. Uh, I, okay, so everyone knows, huge Guillermo Mark. uh, Big, big fan. Uh, I think he's the perfect guy to be like a horror host. And like the way that he introduces the each episode is just awesome. 
uh i didn't love lot 36 like the first one um i liked a lot of parts about it but it is one of those things where tim blake nelson just plays a brutal racist and it's like very just him being a miserable racist piece of shit for the entire duration of the episode and i understand that that's the point but it's just not fun hanging out with that character and uh by the time he does like things wrap up it has an incredible reveal and uh you get some real guillermo isms in the sense that it's like the creature i'm really really like the creature there uh but graveyard rats was one that i'm like boozy needs to see this like that uh, episode two i fucking loved and it's Those got are boozy two words rats. together that make me happy <laughs> yes <laughs> you you would you are gonna love graveyard rats and that, that's what i just like about cabinet curiosity so much already is uh you know they're all standalone episodes you don't need to watch the whole thing if you don't want to but each of them so far i've only seen the two uh i've got uh, taken something out of both of them uh, but yeah what are you thinking about it daniel i'm pretty much in the same boat yeah i love that del toro now has his alfred hitchcock presents yes. show you know and nobody deserves that more lot 36 i thought was okay actually I, the main thing i liked about it was tim blake nelson's performance like he's a horrible yeah. character but yeah watching horrible people suffer is kind of the staple of horror anthologies totally yeah. um but it's super talky and just listening to people explain mythology to each other for a long time until you get the horror at the end and it's really cgi but um it's okay graveyard rats i just fell over myself over that i yeah. loved it it's it's like barbarian but with rats basically yeah, i it's know crazy it, it is so fucking good and yeah boozy so you're gonna love it it's episode two all you gotta do like just click I'm on that i'm so one. happy that i i haven't seen barbarian yet so i don't get any of these references because i i don't want barbarian to be ruined for me and so far so good yeah no you go, it's on disney plus now d plus baby so you gotta gotta get on that i will say that the that's what i was alluding to barbarian's my favorite horror movie of the year by far and uh i like shared a post on instagram saying like barbarian is now on disney plus so you are all obligated to watch it i have not <laughs> had that much interaction in my feed uh like people, <laughs> people messaging me back being like what the fuck did i just watch and i'm like there are so many people that like horror isn't their thing and they watch barbarian i'm like oh no yeah. i guess that's the risk I run by uh, <laughs> recommend <laughs> recommend things. Yeah, it's so, so good. It's my number two. I love it. Yeah, it's uh, it's great. Uh, so yeah. Um, all right. So cabinet of curiosities. Boozy, you got any other ones you want to I, chat about? I have one more I want to talk about. Uh, I I ventured out to the theater to watch this on a date. Uh, so me and my girlfriend went to check out Smile. Oh, nice. I yeah, I did that on my last date night too. <laughs> it's a it's a date movie. It, it does feel very much like that. I feel like there's a lot of uh, whether it's still going on as much. There was a an interesting hype for it, having the the kind of viral marketing of having the people in crowds and stuff like that. So that's kind of cool. Um, overall, I I think this is a very serviceable film. I I think it it. Uh, it, it kind of has a lot of those Blumhouse isms that you see in, in Main Street horror or mainstream horror in terms of, of characters and that sort of thing and even basic story. But I, I found that it did a great job with imagery. I know it's a very simple concept that's, that's been done in, in tons of different ways, but I, I thought it was it was pretty interesting. I, I thought that there was actually some cool kills in it. I, I think that the ending was uh, a little more imaginative than... I would have expected honestly and there was some cool practical effects in this you so. baffled me boozy <laughs> and by that i mean you, two two stars on letterbox you just gave a really good review <laughs> serviceable two stars <laughs> no Nathan i just, just want to exactly like the same way too <laughs> i guess i guess what i'm going with it is i i was expecting truth or dare yeah that that's what yeah that's kind of what i was thinking and, um, and it just it yeah it just i, I think it's a, a serviceable film i i didn't think right. it like so smile off yeah smiles good no wishmaster Two evil never dies <laughs> is that really the, the yeah that's the, the tagline that's a, of it yeah i guess it never have, dies tonight yeah <laughs> <laughs> amazing okay uh, and daniel what do you think of shot smile because you said you saw it yeah, I'm I'm in the same boat. I think it's serviceable. Um, it looks like it fits in that trend of really dumb mainstream horror like Truth or Dare or Countdown or mm -hmm. Friend Request. But mm -hmm. I kind of like those movies. I think yeah. they're fun in a really dumb way. And Smile is just as dumb. It's the same thing. 
it's just that all the actors are super serious like really <laughs> really sad and serious about this pretty dumb horror movie curse um it's okay it's fine i don't have a yeah. whole lot to take about it awesome cool well i do look forward to catching that one when i'm able to because uh there's just too much shit to see right now um if i'm gonna make my way out to the theater i could see terrifier 2 again exactly uh, <laughs> but uh let's go do i have anything else here oh last thing i'll touch on is just uh daniel had done an extensive episode with hayden on cobwebs about the legend of sleepy hollow and like all all facets of the headless horseman tale and i am definitely like you daniel a massive fan of the headless horseman specifically my first experience with it was tim burton's sleepy hollow and that's what i revisited it's one of my favorite movies honestly it made me the goth boy that i am today uh <laughs> like that was the i there's something about sleepy hollow i saw that in the theater with my dad when i was way too young and it just rearranged my brain in a way that it made me love like the gothic aesthetic and even though you know uh, i think you guys even talk about it with like a lot of people at the time are like oh it's like a hammer movie but it's like it's really not because it's completely devoid of color and everything like that but i love the gray grim dark aesthetic of it and i love depth performance that's like the, it gets really comedic at times and um the headless horseman is the coolest movie character maybe ever like in that movie i think he's so fucking badass and that's why i was cackling over daniel's tweet this is the ideal male body <laughs> 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 this is what peak performance looks like um great movie it oozes the halloween spirit for me so uh i am happy i gave it a rewatch for the hundredth time but uh if it's been a while since anyone out there has seen sleepy hollow i i it's such a great film. That movie terrified me as a kid. Like you're talking yeah. about the headless. That's horse, awesome. I was like, yeah. Uh. yeah. No, that. And I remember being like really creeped out by the witch scene. Like the, the mm -hmm. one part that's like heavy CGI, but it works because it's Burton. Um, like when her eyes fly out of her head and shit, I remember that scaring the hell out of me. And I remember losing sleep over um, what I call the chokey. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen Matilda. Uh do you know what Many I'm talking moons about? Ago. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, but, a long time ago. <laughs> but there's the chokey, which is the thing. It's like a room that the the trunchable or whatever her name is locks them in, and there's like spikes on it and nails and shit. That part in Sleepy Hollow, where it's I think it's like Depp's mom is is in it. It's like oh, a it, it's yeah. from um, it's like a mummy. Pit pit, uh, Roger Corman's Pit in the Pendulum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and when it opens up and the blood just pours out, I'm like, ah. Oh this is peak Halloween shit for me. Like just the yeah. aesthetic of the whole thing. But yeah, I loved it. Uh, do you guys have anything else you want to talk, uh, talk about? I'm no, I'm, not, I'm excited sweet, to talk about art. Yes, let's get into, we, we're going to take a brief little break here and then we are going to be talking about Damien Leone's Terrifier 2. So, did you figure out what you're dressing up as tomorrow? He wants to dress up as a real guy who murdered nine people last year. Oh, you're not doing that. It's just a costume. <laughs> that guy's still out there what's up with you and this clown all of a sudden you're like obsessed they never found his body what if he decides to come back here i wouldn't worry about it wait a minute aren't you that guy from the costume shop sir what are you doing it wasn't me he was covered in blood on his shirt and his hands when he got here i'm telling you it was him ellie right down to the little black dot on the tip of his nose. You're really weird, you know that? <laughs> I believe him. About what? Something really bad's gonna happen tonight. No, I, I know when Jonathan's lying, okay? I, I could hear it in his voice. Something's, something's wrong. Look, we're gonna have fun. Mm -hmm. Stress-free environment. Yep. Speaking of surprises, kids, we have a very special guest with us today, all the way from Miles County. Please welcome Art the Clown. Do you have an emergency? 
And welcome to our main feature presentation where we are going to be discussing Damien Leone's Terrifier 2. Uh, so this is the sequel to the film that I know we talked about on the Terror Table like a while back. It would have been when Diego was still on the show. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about Terrifier 1 and I know we had a mixed response among the table. Uh, I think out of the three of us, yeah, Bo Diego and I were fans. I think Boozy, you weren't, you weren't crazy about it. Um, but with this new Terrifier 2, it, it's breaking records right now. It is a movie that was made for $250,000 and it's currently over six and a half million dollars at the box office. It's a huge win for horror. It's a huge win for this team. And uh, I, I'm just going to lead us off and get it right out of the way is you guys, we have a new slasher icon uh, in Art the Clown and it is glorious. Uh, he's amazing. Uh, thoughts, boozy, not it, you touch on in your own words, uh, Terrifier from the original. Um. I don't know. I something about this. I, I I've thought about it because that was quite a while ago when we did talk about Terrifier. But just remembering that experience is it just it felt like a lot, and and I understand why people enjoy it, and I I think the aesthetic of it works perfectly. I think that low budget aesthetic helps it in a lot of ways, and it 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 kind of grimes up the dirtier parts of this film, which there are many um you more yeah. so in terrifier too yeah they, they, they found really, a way to up the ante so really up the ante and and once again yeah like i i do have to commend that it's it's wild that it got made for that much but also i i feel like it it is not a hindrance in any way for them i they they rocked it yeah i think damien the own he's originally a makeup effects artist and he does all the makeup effects himself Daniel, let's get your general thoughts on like, had you seen All Hallows Eve, the original um, Art the Clown? Um, I watched All Hallows Eve actually in the past week leading up to this podcast, just as like research basically. And it's very much a first film. It's it's rough, but it's okay. And I think Art the Clown works pretty well. It's a different actor. I believe his name is Michael Gianelli, um, who actually Damien Leone has said in interviews uh, is not an actor. And he was really just a friend of Damien Leone yeah. um, who did it as a favor, but didn't want to do a full movie version of it. Um, and I saw Terrifier in 2018 around the time it came out. And I was like right down the middle on it. Um, I respected the fact that art the clown was so creepy because i recognize that's not an easy thing to do because mm -hmm. art the clown is very much not just a creepy clown it's a very original character uh and i respected that i respected how effective the kills were i just thought it was kind of a bad movie like structurally and story-wise and character but i rewatched it after seeing terrifier 2 and my feelings for Terrifier 2 have basically bled over to Terrifier 1. And now I really like Terrifier 1. And I actually think it's a much better movie than I gave it credit for originally. Um, it's very well made visually. It has a, a great grimy feel to it. And I think mm. all the actors are pretty strong. There's not a lot for the characters on the page, but I think the actors all do a really good job at making you sympathize with these people and making the violence feel like it matters <clears throat> and not just like it's special effects. Um, so I, I'm a fan of Terrifier, ultimately. I like the first movie. Awesome. Yeah, no, I, I pretty much am in the same boat. I, I liked it the first time I saw it just because, you know, I'm a fan of, and I know both of you guys are as well, but like I've always been a fan of like classic slasher movies and uh, Terrifier felt very gritty and grimy and it felt like something, it, it felt like, you know, we're living in a time where throwbacks have consumed our our culture like everything is either a remake of something or it's nostalgia porn in some ways and some of it gets tiring for me but i felt the terrifier was authentic and i felt like his heart was in the place that i think it it showed on the screen that he has a, a knowledge and respect for classic 80s slasher movies and that is just proven tenfold in terrifier 2 which i think is a as much as i like the original terrifier terrifier 2 is such an improvement in all fronts uh from behind the camera to in front of the camera damien leon's special effect he feels more confident than ever and you can see that in the first the opening of terrifier 2 which manages the opening manages to rival one of the most gruesome scenes in recent horror history is the the hacksaw and and terrifier the opening scene of terrifier 2 it shows that we're we're not safe uh we're about to see some really fucked up shit if it's this movie's two and a half hours 
and they are leading off with that like an opening like that my god uh so i was just on board from the moment it started and another thing i want to touch on is i have grown very tired of the whole synth wave retro like 80s throwback because it's just it's overused uh, you know mm-hmm. obviously there are times where it really works stranger things is still excelling with it uh but i felt like that whole throwback aesthetic feel was wrapped with the guest in 2014 i think that that score was like the perfect throwback until i saw terrifier 2 and man i love the soundtrack of this movie and i think it fits so perfect for it and i get chills thinking about the opening scene where the midnight song kicks in and she's building her her valkyrie suit and it's like i'm just gonna keep gushing about this sorry guys uh the the watching you it feels like it's a commentary on his own work while making the best thing he's ever made because he's a makeup effects artist he has a great understanding of that that side of the process and we're opening up with her building her halloween costume and it's like this is costume ain't no joke like it's a real real work of art and with that synth wave score over top of it and then feels like the credits are like straight out of demons um from the 80s it's i i love i love this movie so much Uh, yeah i love the midnight i've been a huge fan of them for a long time and when their song came over the opening credits i was immediately like oh i'm in good hands here like this isn't just some psycho who got a camera and was able to make a movie like this is someone who i can connect with if he's playing the midnight so totally that that felt real good i i found out about them because of this movie because i love that opening song so much and i've been listening to them nonstop all week like i that i have like my favorites me and my roommate are obsessed with them right now we just if you're in our house you hear the midnights playing and it's funny because like yeah like i said i i have been vocal about like i'm tired of it like uh you know try something try something a little different um i the whole nostalgia porn thing is uh it's starting to get really boring and that's just not it's not felt that like that in terrifier 2 it feels like such an authentic love letter not even a love letter it's just another great 80s horror movie that's now out now and it's blowing audiences away and packing crowds and it's so cool to see uh but i i do know that i ran that this was another reason why i wanted to bring daniel on for this one is because it's this kind of stuff generally isn't Boozy's thing, but I don't know how you feel about it. Uh, Cause I know for the most part, people who really didn't like Terrifier one are loving the second one. And that's what I'm curious to hear where you're at Boozy. If, uh, if Terrifier two clicked with you, if you enjoyed it and uh, or, or where you're at. Um, I will agree with a lot of the things you guys said. I, I think that they did such a good job of turning art into this his own thing he's is his own slasher creation that's that's going to be going forward you're going to see the merchandising on this get huge uh oh yeah it already is those blankets <laughs> it's crazy because it already was with terrifier yeah and that was a movie that was successful but not 6.5 million dollars no, no yeah barely a theatrical like, release for that movie. 200 yeah. 250 thousand dollars is nothing to make a movie that's nothing it is insane what was put on screen mm-hmm. for that uh sorry i got excited again oh no, no. <laughs> um and i I'll, I'll actually say that i while it is very played out the 80s synthwave stuff i just overall really still enjoy that kind of stuff yeah. so it, it's great to hear that it, you know they're they're still able to bring out things that are interesting and fun and, and sound really good with this um and i i, I will say that it it's so well done in terms of capturing the the true violence there they don't shy away from anything there's no detail no rock unturned in in human torture um which is really cool to see like like it's yeah. it's hard to pull off shit like that and and they made it look flawless like you really look like you're peeling somebody like a fucking orange um (laughs) it's it's so weird because like i i think we all actually feel this way is we're not overly gore hounds like we're not the kinds of guys like i don't think any i I could be wrong about you daniel but like torture and extreme violence for the sake of extreme violence has never been my thing Mm -hmm. but when it's presented like this it has a level of playfulness to it Mm -hmm. that and the fact that it does look amazing but it doesn't look real it makes it just fun. Like I, me and my roommate were watching it. We were 
gasping like we were laughing our fucking asses off at the absurdity of what we were mm-hmm. watching like the armed game. <laughs> there's the one scene with that woman where he, it goes on and then he you think it's over and he comes back with bleach and it's like oh my god <laughs> like, what? i watched um david howard thornton talk about this, that scene in an interview and he said they had two shooting days for that scene and then something with covid happened and they got locked down and damon leone was like well we have nothing else to do let's just go do more with that scene so two day shoot turned into a five day shoot just for that scene <laughs> that's, and we all reap the benefits from it <laughs> and that's where obviously we're gonna jump all over the map here and then find our way back to a normal conversation but it's the excitement of this movie it, there's so much to talk about but we gotta like you just mentioned david howard thornton who i just fucking love as a human being and yes. as a performer he he's this, so he's great like, I, I, if you ever have the chance to listen to him in interviews, you'll never hear the guy cuss. Like he'll never say a swear. He doesn't curse. He's such he's a such proper. A sweetheart. He's a theater kid at heart. Like he's he's a, from musical theater, and he's performing the most heinous acts of violence I've seen on screen <laughs> with a big smile and like, oh my god, I cannot believe his performance is unfucking real. Like I'm I'm not gonna lie. I think I was like Boozy where I when we when terrifier started i was like of course it's creepy it's a clown but clowns have never really been my thing and it's like it's so you know for like i hope this doesn't sound flippant but it's easy to make a clown creepy because people are just they have an inherent creepiness exactly but the he for like he's great in terrifier but terrifier too he builds onto this character in his expressions and i my favorite thing about him is how he never makes a sound like he'll be yeah. laughing, but there's no sound coming out. And it's that's just so creepy. And then like the black lipstick around his mouth. And then the the way he works with his teeth, he's a, such a physical performance. And it's like Looney Tunes meets Rowan Atkinson meets Freddy Krueger. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's unreal. He does use uh, Mr. Bean as a comparison of influence a lot in interviews. Totally. And you can see it. You can see it in his performance. And it's so funny thinking about because I grew up a huge bean head. Uh, I don't know if we call those. Is that a? Is that what we call the fandom? Beanheads. <laughs> I was sure. about to guess other names, but I Beanies? realized we probably Beaners? shouldn't get. Yeah, no. <laughs> Beaners. Uh, yeah, no, boozy. Let's hear. Let's hear more. Because, uh, yeah, two and a half hour movie for a sequel to a movie you yeah. weren't even really a fan of. So that's kind of where I, I wanted to div- divulge further. Is I, I'm overly not a fan of this film. I. I get why I see all the reasons why people like it. It's mm-hmm. it, the simple thing for me is like it. It was too extreme, and yeah. I, I think when you guys are talking, like you guys are are kind of gushing about that bleach scene, and <laughs> for me there was like I don't know, like it, it it felt like too much for me at that point. And that's and the, fair, totally yeah. fair. And and I don't feel like I'm that squeamish. I just I felt like it was, and I I love dark things i love things that are are just fucking mean and and torturous to the human soul and body but it, this is on a different level and that yeah. that is you know for a lot of people like you guys included i'm i'm daniel you've already said off the bat you really liked it so um for a lot of people that worked in that and that works yeah. works within the film i it just for me it the the length of it and just how fucking violent it was it it was just hard to to get through so it's i don't know exhausting for you uh, yeah i i don't know it's just uh, i there wasn't a lot for me to latch on to i feel like like the the characters are there but i i didn't really connect with any of them and maybe that's oh, just me yeah so i love i love her yeah so it just overall it was uh, a very violent experience and uh, kudos to them for making something that made me feel really uncomfortable yeah no it's it's amazing when like the, even the most like because you're a very seasoned horror fan you've seen a lot and the fact that it can still make you scream and it's it, it's gratuitous like that's that's why I, think I when when people sorry I just, when people talk about like there's all the buzz about how like people are like throwing up and and fainting watching this yeah. i i get it but <laughs> I don't know it's just like dude I didn't need that <laughs> like you 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 don't want that feeling is that what you're saying yeah and it's not that I, I felt that it's just it's like I can understand how people felt that way yeah 
Yeah, no, it's this is definitely one that is not for everyone. Like this mm -hmm. is not a movie that I would recommend to I recommend it to specific types of horror fans and uh even i have i have a couple friends in saskatoon who reached out and they're like hey have you seen this movie i'm going to see it tonight and i'm like you are the last person i would imagine going mm -hmm. to see terrifier 2 and i talked to her after the movie and it was like yeah like people are not ready for this like the fact that it is getting into so and it's just hitting theaters in canada now mm -hmm. so like that 6.5 million dollars that it made is from like the u.s so this movie is going to be so much more successful than it even is already. But so many, since it's so terrifier, we saw at the film festival, Saskatoon Fantastic Film mm -hmm. Festival. And like, that's where you go to see these kinds of movies, not in mainstream cineplexes and landmarks. And it's crazy to think that a movie like this is making it to those screens and making it in front of such a wide audience that it's not made for. But at the same time, it's it's unbelievable how it seems like people are generally reacting to it. They're they're really taking to it, and you know it's got great reviews. And um, for the most part, people seem to to be just obsessing over it, like Daniel and myself. Uh, but yeah, it's it's just a wild time. Daniel, yeah, this movie felt really it. it felt really special to me because when I was going into this movie in theaters, I felt nervous. I felt kind of scared walking in there and I never feel that yeah. going into horror movies, but I was like, I don't know what I'm getting myself into here. And when I see art, the clown for me, it's the first time I have felt like I knew what it was like for people in 1984 who saw Freddy Krueger. Yeah. Cause I love Freddy Krueger with all my heart. Freddy Krueger doesn't scare me. I've probably just seen him in media way too much. Um, but when I see art, the clown, he makes me nervous. Like he is a really, really scary figure. And I just love that. He's not, an homage to like a past slasher character he's such an original character yeah. he breaks so many slasher rules i mean i feel like it's almost an iconic moment at this point in the first terrifier when he busts oh, out a pistol amazing that's my <laughs> favorite like, part of that movie <laughs> yeah like this guy will do anything there yeah. are no slasher rules that apply to him and my love for Arthur Clown has expanded uh, because of watching interviews with David Howard Thornton. Because yeah. like you've said, Mitch, he is the sweetest person. I'm so happy for him and his success. Yeah. Like, regardless of Damien. what happens. Yeah, yeah regardless Damien's of what happens to either of their careers at this point, they'll be able to make a living off of horror conventions for the rest of their lives. Absolutely. Like, just because of these movies. Yeah. No, and they 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 absolutely deserve it. Like, this whole team should be so proud. Uh, they clearly are. Um, but that's what I feel like they I agree with you about the original terrifier terrifier that like I do like those characters and there was enough for me to latch on to it was just a very kind of standard stalker slasher movie but terrifier 2 takes on it, it just it it ups the ante in all departments and I really feel like the the lead I, I don't I'm saying I love her and now I can't remember her name Lauren Lavera I believe is her name. yes she is Sienna she is tremendous 44 years old by the way like, she is yeah wow she's like built like an action hero in this and i heard she has like multiple black belts she's yeah. like such a badass she is a badass and i love the iconography of the valkyrie going up against art and like that's okay one of the other reasons why i wanted to do this episode specifically for our halloween episode is both terrified like this whole franchise lives in the halloween spirit and it really feels like a halloween movie and that's always exciting is you know for people like us who love the autumn season and spooky mm -hmm. season and horror movies it's like it's such a it's it's candy to the eyes the movie just feels like candy but that kind of gross candy that you get cavities for from and have to get <laughs> like um yeah I, I i can just keep fucking ranting about it so i'm gonna keep passing it around i, I don't want to hog the mic here because there's, there's just so much to talk about with this movie i, I want to hear more from daniel honestly yeah well, you mentioned how it's a Halloween movie and it feels like an ultimate Halloween movie to me because you get a Halloween party. It ends in a haunted Halloween maze. I love it whenever movies go yeah. into a haunted maze. Um, and it has like the greatest trick or treat scenes ever. Like both when Art the Clown is trick or treating to his um, victim in the yellow room. Uh, and then also when kids come trick or treating and he hands out candy inside <laughs> his victim's head yeah <laughs> uh, and all the parents are just like oh that's such a cool effect and meanwhile on halloween i can't answer the door in my ghost face costume or kids get upset so <laughs> i don't think that would have worked in real life but um it is like an ultimate halloween movie but i will say my greatest request for terrifier 3 i'm gonna put this into the world right now i want terrifier 3 to be a christmas movie 
because you can't top how good a Halloween movie this is. And I want Art the Clown in a full Santa costume going down a chimney and then killing the whole family. Yes, that would be delicious. I love the idea of that. But I also (laughs) that's something that Damien has talked about a lot in uh, in interviews is how art is just so synonymous with Halloween because that's the only time where he can blend in. That's um, true, yeah. And like that's why it makes it so difficult to imagine the character at another time of the year. But I do think that, you know, there could be a lot oh, of come interesting on. Red things. Red and green. You paint him red and green. Yeah. He, he mimes <laughs> in front of places. He already he does a... a lot of miming to begin with. Yeah, It'll exactly. Blend right in. Hacks off Rudolph's <laughs> nose. What do you think uh, art does for the rest of the year? Poops. That's, <laughs> that's the other thing. I love in Terrifier 1 that they show that he shits. <laughs> you never see michael myers taking a poop <laughs> no like does michael myers go to the toilet because we exactly. know he eats i know he and like, the dog that's and that's okay this is you know divulging a little bit with a conversation that happens a lot with the druid's hand recently is like people are you know since they now have someone to talk they watch something and they go oh i can ask you questions about it like what but how was she able to be on the stage and then all of a sudden she's up in the room and then all of a sudden she's at the the pyre I'm like, can you imagine in the nun, like in the Conjuring movies, if you watch the nun drive location to location, uh, <laughs> and like that's like part of the mystery is like just just imagine that, like them walking around. It's like it's a horror movie, like that's and it's supernatural. Like I didn't. Yeah, you know that don't have to see how the sandwich is made all the time. Like no, but but just the, accept people or places. You can picture Art taking a dump because they show you, uh, and then when he writes his name on the wall in feces, um, but like. It, you completely like everyone always thinks about what, what would it be like for freddy krueger to go to the washroom like how does he wipe <laughs> i'm sorry i'm taking this into a whole other place it doesn't need like, to go i feel like he'd he'd like use the one hand to grab the paper mm-hmm. and then pass it <laughs> off to the other hand i feel like he's he cuts, creative he cuts enough. the paper yeah, yeah. That hand. cuts off a little, a little slice he's creative enough he'll he'll know what to what to do but yeah it's it's uh it's just an incredible performance from david howard thornton it's executed so beautifully and i the other thing i love about it is they they really show it, it feels very much like the movies that you can you can feel as influences like demons like in that title card and then also sleepaway camp uh and like the one thing that i i had a gripe with at first until the movie wrapped up is I'm so tired of like the overbearing mother trope, but that's also a part of this genre. And it's specifically and Halloween ends too. Exactly. It's Halloween ends. It's sleepaway camp where Felissa Rose makes a cameo in this film. And um, there's just, it, it just bleeds that it, it feels like pure. Like it's not just nostalgia porn. It feels pure and it came from the right place. And yeah, I, I just love it. How do you guys feel about this movie as opposed to the original being a fully supernatural horror movie? Mm, well, I I prefer like you're talking about because it kind of does go into like dream sequences almost like it, some of it mm-hmm. feels like Nightmare on Elm Street a little bit. It yeah, does. there's a lot of supernatural. I mean, for one thing, Art comes back from the dead. So you've got that. Yeah. But also he's got an imaginary sidekick. Uh, that also our two main characters can see and nobody else can see. Um, Sienna has some kind of a magic sword by the end. Like there's a lot. I'm really, really intrigued by the mythology this movie is setting mm-hmm. up. And I'm assuming there's going to be a lot answered in Terrifier 3. Um, but this isn't just a crazy guy dresses up a clown and kills people. There's a lot of like witchery going on in this movie. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I don't know so where it's going or what's that. happening. Yeah, for sure. I think they did a great job that way. And like, of course, there's going to be a Terrifier 3. They set it up perfectly for that. But like you were saying, I, I think they did such a great job of not bottlenecking themselves in terms of what their character can do. Because you're right, it, like just the fact that he's back from the dead, you you open it up wide with something like that. And and I think that there are a lot of similarities in a good way to like a Freddy Krueger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I certainly am a fan of that side of things. I think it builds... It, it opens up the options of what we're capable of seeing on the screen by adding that little bit of a supernatural element i also mm-hmm. did love the addition of the imaginary character or like the 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 other little girl like it's genuinely creepy and i love uh, her so much it's totally. such a good addition yeah and, and that's another rule broken like you gave your yeah. slasher a kid sidekick and yeah. somehow it works it's amazing yeah no i totally agree 
I love that stuff. And I know that's one thing from some people that I've spoken to about it, that like the sword stuff didn't, it's like that just felt stupid to them. But I'm like, everything about this is kind of stupid. Like that's like, and I mean that with love. Like I, mm-hmm. I like the over the top nature of it all. So like when you add in a, like a glowing sword, I'm more so just, I was just excited at that point. And uh, I don't know, I feel in the, with the help of the score and like the, the midnight song and it just, starts to feel epic like it feels so much bigger than what we saw in terrifier which once again i I enjoyed but everything just feels bigger it works yeah it really it really does and i i think the first terrifier is kind of like the first texas chainsaw massacre where the first time you see it it just feels like psychos got a camera and made a movie but Mm -hmm. then you see it again and you sort of see the the filmmaking and what the director's doing but this movie is so much more of an epic Um, I do think there is some big supernatural mythology going on that we don't fully understand yet that I Mm -hmm. am extremely intrigued by and very excited about. And also the reason like, I I like Damien Leone so much. I think he's getting dismissed a lot as immature or an edgelord or something, but I think he's so much smarter than people realize. And I think he cares about his characters so much. And like, that's what I really need in a movie like this. I need protagonists to really, really root for. And he gives us that because I, I love Sienna and her little brother. They're so great. Yeah, no, I entirely agree. And that is something, yeah, like it's so easy to dismiss movies like this. Like even Terrifier 1, I can understand how people would feel that way because it is like, of course, it's going to be shocking seeing a woman get hacked down the center of her body and like it's gratuitous and everything. But there is, like you said, there's so much more to his vision that it, it, you can't just dismiss him as as an edgelord. Um, there, there are plenty of other examples out there of filmmakers who do stuff like that, where it's like, you just know that they're doing it for, cause it's going to, it's cheap. It's going to get a reaction out of you, but he hand builds all this stuff. And like, I know you shouldn't need to know that to enjoy the movie, but it does make it so much better knowing that it's like, when you're seeing that absolute brutality, like specifically the yellow room, the victim with the one that goes on for fucking ever. Um, it's just, it's so, there's something about it that it's, it's yeah it's gross but it still feels fun like it it, it does yeah it's, it's so not, it goes so far that it yeah. lets you know it's fake and you can just have fun with it totally it's like and no disrespect to people who like the saw movies because i there those movies have their merit and everything but there's you, you don't feel that way when you're watching people get ripped apart in those movies and i guess on, on the flip side something else that did it really well this year was hellraiser they have moments like that too mm-hmm. and it's treated completely differently like it's so earnest and serious and it works in my opinion. Um, but it's, yeah, I don't know, it's just good filmmaking. It's just really inventive storytelling and I love it. Right. You guys have uh, anything else you want to talk about with Terrifier 2? I just, I, I, I guess uh, I just want to mention that that's a great comparison talking about Hellraiser versus this this year in terms of the violence. And, and I'm just kind of trying to think like maybe that's one of the reasons why I liked Hellraiser more is it's a little more straightforward with it and a little yeah. darker in terms of not maybe but not showing you as much at the same time yeah and they they still show you a lot and they movie. and they yeah that's, yeah but uh it's a, yeah it's the same type of violence but sh- displayed in a completely different way and uh i'm i'm all for both of them but uh but terrifier 2 is definitely the most fun i've had ah, no that's oh god it is so hard to say what like uh, there's two movies i just had an incredible amount of fun watching horror movies this year and uh yeah it's it's what a good what a great time to be a horror fan there's been so it's, many great horror movies this year it's an astoundingly good year for horror like i already have a top 10 horror movies of the year that is rock solid and i haven't even made a top 10 horror of the year in a long time but i'm just yeah. so loving everything that's coming out this year not you not guys everything feel like so it much. started slow and has really picked up mm, the halloween no. season has been huge yeah for sure I feel like it's been pretty because I loved X and X was like right out the gate. X and, is my favorite still. Yeah. Oh, X, yeah, it's great. Uh, X of Barbarian fucking this. It's yeah. There's Pearl. so much. Oh, man. Pearl. Yeah. There's so the monsters. I, love I, I, monsters. Yeah. You, yeah, I know you, you loved it. Hey? <laughs> I, I did. Yeah. Uh, I forgot but, that came out. You didn't watch it, Boozy? No, I haven't. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah no i don't know i think uh you guys i think this is a good time to to wrap it up it's been it's been awesome talking horror movies with you as always daniel and Uh great seeing you again boozy 
What's yeah, that? it was it was great seeing uh, seeing both of you guys, Daniel. I know I haven't seen you in quite a while. It's always great when you're on here. And you absolutely, always, man. I, I love hearing your opinions, and you you have such a, a deep knowledge of horror. It is, and yeah. I love hearing about all the classic films. I think that's my favorite part because that's something that uh, I do try and dabble in once in a while. But like just to hear some of the things you talk about in some of the films like every time you're on here i am writing things down for my letterbox yeah um oh thanks and I, man and i, I just think s- they're fun yeah no and i 100 percent agree and i i love your opinions i, I love yeah. to hear like even if we don't agree on a lot of films sometimes <laughs> yeah um but- i i, I think i just love hearing your takes on everything and i will say on a personal note and this will be kind of uh more for us than it will be room with those lights in the background it would look like the uh nostromo <laughs> just wait i do you... have those lights going around the whole no room, no, no. But like on... like the the walls like just the oh whole... the entire yeah. wall <laughs> yeah yeah and if you want more of daniel's voice and you know like everything boozy just said you got to be listening to cobwebs it truly is one of my favorite podcasts uh daniel do you want to plug that a little bit talk about what you've had going on because you've had a lot of really great episodes this this uh halloween season oh thanks man uh yeah it's the cobwebs podcast you can find it on any podcast app um we've been doing all through september and october alternating weeks between a series on the psycho franchise and then just kind of big topic episodes um so mitch actually was chris Hurtado and i's guest for the original psycho um every psycho episode is chris and i and then a different guest um and then also premiering today on halloween on halloween is our episode on the psycho remake um that's an interesting one uh yes. but i would say my favorite podcast episode i've done in a long time is the sleepy hollow episode so that's the one i would recommend first because we talk about every uh sleepy hollow adaptation and it was just a giant three hours of nerding out about that story yeah Yeah, that podcast kept me company while i was on on my flights from la to vancouver i love to hear that yeah it was awesome and it inspired me to come home and the first thing i did was pull sleepy hollow off my blu-ray shelf and watched it again so uh, yeah, definitely to check that out. And thank you all for listening to, to this episode. We hope everyone has had a great Halloween season. Uh, at the time of recording this, we're recording this on October 30th, and I intend on having it out for tomorrow for Halloween. Uh, so that'll be fun. But I'm going to Fright Nights tonight in Vancouver. It's like a, at our fair, there's like a bunch of Halloween mazes and stuff. And okay. I'm really excited for that. It's pouring That's rain, so though. Cool. So that'll be fun. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Thank you all for listening, and we will see you next time on The Terror Table. (laughs) 